Good afternoon, everybody. TPUG is happy to present today a very special guest, uh, World of Commodore. It's Bill Hurt, former Commodore engineer and lead of the 128 and some other stuff. Ted Bunch stuff of and a bunch of stuff. So we're happy to have him here. I hope you enjoy and uh, give him your undivided attention. So. <laughs> As, as he mentioned, I'm Bill Hurd. I'm a recovering Commodore engineer, as I call myself. And uh, uh, first rule, there are no rules. If you've if you got a question or a comment, just go ahead and shout it out. If you think I'm telling, if I'm not telling the truth, call me on it. Uh, but, you know, so it's real, real relaxed here about this. So um, I refer to Commodore as a Greek tragedy in three acts. See, I'm setting them away from the... So that because I start flailing right as I talk, and uh, you know I didn't want to ruin his laptop right away. Maybe later in the show I can. <laughs> so, but I refer to working at Commodore as or Commodore itself as a Greek tragedy in three acts. And I'm from Act Two. Uh, you know, it's like I'm the last. I'm from that group that knew what it was like to work with Jack Tramiel, and then later not to work into having gone. So I was from that transition time that that Act Two period. So, and now my monitor is showing something different than what's up there. And this is why I'm going to ask for technical help. I'll keep talking. I hate computers. Absolutely hate them. So do we. Yeah. I, you, they never do it fast enough. They never, you know, they do what you tell them to, not what you want them to do. And that, that to me is a big difference. Okay, it's working out? What, did I freeze it up or something? You, you know, when I was young, I could fix them. Now I just break them when I get there. But I'm assuming you all know what that logo is. It's probably the only group anywhere, right, that knows what this logo is. I, I, I used to say, you know, do, do you remember Commodore? And then I'd say, well, did your parents have a Commodore? And then did they up in the attic? Is there a Commodore? No, I just don't say anything at all, right? And you see a show like the 80s show, and they talk about just how Apple brought home computers to us all. Well, I don't believe that. Okay. You're welcome to believe it. Just get out if you do. <laughs> but the, you know, to, to the victor's go, you can rewrite history a certain amount, and that, that's certainly what's being done. Uh, you know, again, on this 80s show, they, they, they showed the, the Apple II dozens of times. They mentioned the PC twice and didn't mention Commodore once. But as, as you know, as, as this group probably knows, you know, the Commodore 64 sold 27 million and is in the Guinness Book of World Records for having sold the most single computer of anything. Yes? Yeah, but the difference is Commodore didn't pay the show to advertise yeah. them. <laughs> right. Apple and IBM did. Right, right. It's, and, and I could tell you stories that yeah, offline because about who pays to actually be in documentaries. They have to pay them now to do that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, again, to the victors go the spoils, right? And, and we're relegated to a basement somewhere in Canada. <laughs> so, you know, the, in, in, and you may run into a Commodore person, and, and we act a little strange, other than the burnout, where we don't necessarily go running and digging in the basement to pull old stuff out. I'm going to try and watch my language here. Let's throw something at me and fuck load it. Um, and and it's, it's, we're, we're kind of a melancholy bunch, you know, because for... For me, it was Camelot. I mean, what better place to work, right? And, and then to watch it die the way it did and die on the grapevine and all due to our own hand. Nobody beat us. We beat ourselves, our bad management in the end. I was gone by then. But it still doesn't mean it was any less sad. So you know the, 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 the five stages of, of death. Uh, there's, uh, oh, what is it? The one was vandalism, I think. Vandalism, acceptance, denial, all those things. Y'all, y'all know what we call this? The common people. What's that? Chicken, Chicken lips. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, at some point, you know, we end up with this. <laughs> That's us. This one guy said on Facebook, "I can't unsee it ever." <laughs> oh, this is the wrong one. Oh well, you're going to get a different. Uh, we're just going to show some pictures here. So, I got hired originally by MOS. This is the building uh, where I worked in. And we were just telling stories. See, now I'm all kind of out of order. We've been telling so many, I've been telling so many stories outside. I've forgotten which ones I've told or not. But, um, you know, I got my interview literally by accident I got in there. And the only reason I got in 
Um, I, I'd interviewed badly with one engineer, and I'm like, oh, you know, I tried too hard, right? And, and by, by the way, up until now, I'd been saving my money for an Atari 400, and I just spent $99 on a stick of 64K DRAMs at home. I'm going, I'll build something with these. Never got to use them because I ended up working for a company that actually used 64K DRAM, not 48K like Apple did. So that's a joke. <laughs> so the, the, but the way I got my job, I was in front of Bob Russell, and I'm doing mm, And then he said something like, well, you can load accumulate, uh, load X05 uh, uh, or something. I'm like 8205. And he looks at me and he starts muttering some other mnemonics, and I start muttering the machine code back at him. And at one point he goes, okay, well, we'll have you come in and talk to you. So it's like almost by an accident I got hired. Then I almost blew it when I jumped in the, the, the boss's chair by accident. And it, it, it was a miracle I got there, right? But the thing about Commodore is it, it was how you stayed, right? And there are really some, there was two groups of us. There's a really bright people, but they didn't necessarily know how to get crap done. And I had already, I'd been in the service, I'd already had things go through production, and so I think it showed I had kind of that drive to, to do stuff, and that turned out to be the Commodore way. And it, I didn't even know until I read Brian Bagnell's book, I think they hired me as a technician. I just didn't know it, so I didn't act like it. And by the second week there, I'm in charge of a product, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But the, the so this building here, the reason I show it is I saw the movie the other day, um, Game Over. And, you know, I, I don't watch a lot of documentaries because it's kind of like I was there and it's like, it, it'll make me sad again, remember, melancholy, all of that. But when they showed the guy walking up to his Atari office, the original office, you see the weeds? We even saw weeds in this one too. It's, it's like, oh, I got goosebumps because I remember walking up to this building my first time. I remember parking on the wrong side of the building. What was going on there was we had polluted the water and part of it, we were a Superfund site by this time, and so the EPA had uh, put it, had us put in aerators, so the water sprinkling like this to blow the chemicals out of the ground. Those chemicals landed on my car, <laughs> so it, and it made it all sticky. And and then I had parked under a tree, so by the time I come out, I have these leaves stuck to my windshield, and you know, and just putting the wipers on, they just got stuck. I mean, it's just so. But that's on that side of the building, so I learned to park on this side of the building. And right, so here we work with a chip fab right below you. What could be better? It's like, oh, right? It's, it's a, and here you're going to start hearing some of the resentment, right? We hear about computers. Oh, we invented the home computer. You used our chips. You know, that's the way I feel. No, it's not quite because they did do some things earlier, okay? But at the end of the day, we had some, we had the best chip, the big chip, right? Um, and, and she's a cruel mistress, so we'll talk about her a little bit. She, she makes beautiful colors and then has the crappiest timings in the world for D-rays. Um, but no, I mean, what could be better? So we worked on the top floor, three to a room, bright blue, psychotic blue we called it. And we, we didn't care, three people, they'd have put four of us in there if they didn't have to have a door, you know, to go in the office. And we didn't care, it was downstairs. And I was telling stories earlier about how you look out your window and see big old trucks of liquid nitrogen pulling up out back, and one time there's this big boom sound in the basement. They're like, "Don't worry about it." Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, my second week there. Yeah, I'm thinking about the first week. I'll jump to the second week. The um, they had this thing called a TED, a text display chip, and. The idea behind Ted, you all know who Jack Tramiel is, right? We had done this Commodore 64, and in Jack's mind, that was the Apple killer. We didn't need to do another Apple killer. We had Apple killer. So the next one was, he was going after um, Sir Clive Sinclair. He really was irritated a little bit, probably in a, you know, in a competitive way, but he wanted a business market, a low-cost business market. And people go, well, it's not a Commodore 64. No, it's not. It's a low-cost, so 10 means text display. So it was a single chip. It's not a single chip system, but the smallest one only had 11 or nine chips in it originally. 
And, and it's like supposedly that was written on a stone tablet that they went up to Jack's office and got it and it says there should be only nine chips on here. And, and, and it, the idea of a built-in sound of 121 colors, all these things, that, that was, that's what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be a business machine, right? Well, when I get there, the third engineer who's worked on it's leaving. And their prototype of what they had done was a useless piece of crap. Because it was a Vic chip stuck in a wire wrap board. I'm just showing wire wrap so you all know what it looks like. You guys do, but not everybody does. But the, um, I, I looked at it and I'm like, you know, they, they, it, 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 the part I'm skipping over is I had looked at what they were doing. I'm going, oh, are you doing a bus share where you're doing this and that? And you're getting on and off the bus with the 6845 type timings. And the guy's like, yeah, how do you know that? I'm like, I'm doing one at home, right? Because I'm like you guys, I started as a hobbyist, right? It's because my 64K of DRAM were supposed to go on there at one point. Well, that's almost all it took. The guy's like, I got my replacement. So by the second week there, second to third week, I'm in charge of this thing called TED. Now, I'm a long-haired 23-year-old kid um, who, you know, showed up in jeans for his interview. The, and it had a VIC chip in it, this, this thing. I threw it in the trash. I mean, literally dumped it in the trash because there's no way that the VIC chip emulates the TED chip in any meaningful way. So that's my introduction to the TED chip. They're like, oh, you're hired, you're in charge of TED. And I said, great, in the trash we go. Uh, you, you guys are probably the only crowd that would understand this. The whole thing up until then was you, 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 if you use 6845 timings, you had to wait till your little turn to get on the bus. And of course, the 64 said shared the bus with, with the processor. And uh, that's what we were doing, and this slide's for somebody else, but now that you've seen it, that's the one, that's the one. So this is response to, to this. I remember uh, the bo my boss, uh, Shrav Shinshi, reached in his Commodore brand file cabinet. You know we made furniture, right? You know we made calculators, right? We made um, typewriters. Typewriters. We made uh, the, the, the furniture for outside on your deck. It's like... So he reached in his Commodore thing and pulled this out and said, this is what we're going after. And this is what I was introduced to. Now again, this is, this is uh, Jack Tramiel's vision now. Anybody know why it only has 121? You all probably know. Why does it only have 121 colors? Instead of 128. Yes? Because black is black is black no matter how Right, because H8 to black is black. See the, the left-handed one? <laughs> So, but it had sound, all that kind of stuff in it. And it was designed as a family, 116, 264, 364. Look at the case design. I mean, it's beautiful, right? I mean, I thought so as a kid. And, and people, so one of the things we did was the joystick port is not the Atari joystick port. See, we even call it the Atari joystick port. Well, first, if you were to, and I don't, didn't bring the right slide set with me, my apologies, but I'll, I'll talk enough, trust me. <laughs> um, if you looked at the case design of the 116, you'll see there's no room on there for Atari ports. You know? So it was actually it's designed as a system. If you look in the board in there, every part seems to fit, all nine of them. And and so 264 is supposed to sell for $79 for a business machine. Meanwhile, uh, the Commodore 64s are selling for uh, $199, right? So we are just saying 364, anybody know what it did? You know what it did. It, it, it talked. Somebody said it. You mean the extra software in it? We stole the guys from TI Speak and Spell. <laughs> they worked at Commodore, Texas. Dr. Richard Wiggins, uh, a guy named Tim Brightman. And this is the Speak and Spell was heavy duty stuff. It was in the movie E.T., right? That's technology. Somebody at home, you could go, you've seen a computer? No. Do you, do you have a Speak and Spell? Yeah, right? So it talked, and actually, there was a, a vision for that. They had worked on something called Magic Desk, and we had Magic Voice, and Magic Voice was a cartridge based on some of that work, but we had hardware. There was actual hardware in here that did this. So the phonemes and stuff like that were hard-coded. We did a gate array that, that did it. They rented time in a, uh, in a studio to do all of this stuff. And so the 364V, um, was a talking desktop motif where you could say, 
discard or throw away and you, you know remove it with your mouse and we had a mouse and all the things that Macintosh claimed to invent later we were doing in color and with voice then let's see what the next slide is oh this stack really sucks <laughs> Here's, here's Jack Tramiel holding the 364 and a 264. The next day he's gone. Right? I somebody had just sent this to me. I actually around with the time he passed away, and things changed for us. Right? Uh, without Jack there, he he had instrumented a company that needed a strong leader because we were all pretty animalistic people ourselves and things. And um, so I, I was just visioning that is why I jumped ahead to that. But now I'm going to back up and tell Ted's stories. So when I get there, Ted was broken, the chip. They were on Red 3 or Red 4, right? And what they would do is they would work under the microscope and they had these little whisker wire probes, cat's whiskers. And they would dig down into the metal, and then they would pick up signals. So they're trying to figure out why a chip that costs like $500,000 every time you run it, they're trying to figure out why it doesn't work. Well, the reason we had gotten into this problem was back in those days, we had something called a DRC, would tell you if you got too close, a design rule check. But if you ran right across it, it's a, it's a perfect short. We didn't have any electrical rule checks. So what happened was they had done this with A10, the address line 10, and you couldn't write to the register to put it into NTSC mode. So I'm there one day, and they, they, the guy at the microscope, he goes, okay, turn on the microscope light. All right, turn it off. Okay, we're in NTSC mode. And I'm going, did you just use photons to flood the register to trip the thing into NTSC? He goes, yeah. Mm -hmm. I go, oh. <laughs> I am working in the right place. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, it, that was, it, it, and so here we are now, like the fifth rib, but that's the kind of not too much earlier we've been doing this in Ruby Lith. Anybody familiar with that? They actually made chips by cutting red film, Ruby colored, and then they would condense it down, they would, they would take it down photographically until it was chip sized. So the fact we were even using a CAD system at all was fairly new. The, the 6502 was hand laid out. I'll tell you a quick, yeah. forget it, just ask me later where's a picture of a calculator and some dogs. <laughs> so, remember, Jack Jamil had said there shall be nine chips. Well, I come in and I'm from a background where I had learned to make uh, a battery backed up system work even when the, bat the voltage was fluttering right around 103 volts and going up and down, all this. And I looked at what they had done, and again, remember, it's a basically the, the history before it was the chip designers put a bunch of said, here's a chip and here's what we think should go around it. And the two engineers before me had said, I'm out of here. Well, I looked at it and said, you need a reset circuit. Well, no, you'll get fired. <laughs> Still need a reset circuit. And you'll get fired. I put in a reset circuit. They went and they told Jack. They came back and said, that's fine. People were like, how come you didn't get fired? They really wanted to be fired, I think. <laughs> but but the, the thing was, Jack didn't want nine chips. He wanted the least amount of chips. And I understood that. So this was like, my, this, it's not my third week, but it's like my fourth week there when I tell them they're about to go into mass production with a huge mistake. So we added another chip to tip. Meanwhile, you guys know about C64s, right? Supposedly it's a popular computer. You ever seen one sparkle? The old ones, light blue on dark blue sparkle. Just, right? um, the DRAM timing really s is screwed up. <laughs> I'm trying. It, it doesn't work. The, 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 the Commodore 64 really actually on paper does not work. We didn't care. We just wanted it under your Christmas. Now I say we, I'm a, I'm a conscientious engineer. I always want to do good. But I'm telling you about the corporate attitude is we had to get it under your tree for Christmas. 
And then when you bring it in, we'll exchange it for one that works better. But we still got our sale out of it. So um, it, 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 we really did have problems. And so when I was there, they had done what's called a Tiger Team. And they were trying to find ways to um, make the C64 work. And so one of the tricks they did, if you've ever seen the light blue sparkle on the dark blue, they changed it so every cell that didn't have a, uh, a character in it, they changed the foreground color to dark blue. So now it's still sparkling, it's sparkling dark blue on dark blue. <laughs> so and that, that was big. Those guys I got, got $5,000 or something for thinking of that. Um, we were shipping bad units. I, I personally wis witnessed a skid of C64s with a sign on it said bad. Later, it's just the sign says bad laying on the floor. <laughs> they shipped it. <laughs> we weren't allowed in production at first. They'd come, they send the security guards come get us by we, I mean R&D. They didn't want us to find out what they were doing to make the 64 ship. You know, it's a culture all its own by that time. And um, they were soldering capacitors on the RAS signal and stuff, which is just a horrible thing to do to DRAMs, but it'd make it pass the test. But it didn't mean it worked better. Something had worked worse, but it passed the test. And actually, I, so I ran into, I went to different bars. I was going at all the bars at the time. So when you work at a place like this, you've got to have testosterone. Testosterone requires alcohol. And, you know, it's just, it's a nutso, it was animal house environment. It, you know, some say because I got there. And I, by the way, long hair and stuff, right? So, but I ended up drinking with him at the equivalent of Applebee's, the production engine. And I said, we can help you. So we start break, tearing down a barrier there where I said, you know, I actually, you don't need to hide it from us. And, uh, you know, so we started getting along better that way, where I'd say, well, if you change this instead of the cap, you'd work better. Meanwhile, one of the, one of the urban legends that's true is to make our numbers, we were shipping um, C64s to a trailer on the premises. Well, it's not really shipping them if you do that. But that, that's what we were doing. We were calling them shipped, and we had trailers of these things out on the way in the back lot. Well, one day they go to open one, and it's empty. Turns out the security guards were in business for themselves. <laughs> and here come the FBI through. I, I can't tell you, I've must seen the FBI come through this place four times by the time for all this. There goes, there goes one of my favorite uh, security guards. Oh my god, crap. He's the guy, let me he used to carry the beer in the front door, you know, instead of the back door. <laughs> Meanwhile, we finally come out with one of the Vic chips that didn't sparkle. We went to what's called a beryllium lead frame. It got the heat out more, that was another problem. And suddenly, you, you, you turn around and your R&D unit on your lab bench may swipe the VIC chip out of it and take it home. You put it in and be gone again. I mean, going like that. You go to the bathroom and do. So I learned I had a magical power. If I went to the head of the lab, I said, send up a tube of VIC chips. I'd send up a tube. I put it out and I put a, I put a note on it that says, take one. It turns out it took me about a tube and a half to saturate the environment. And no longer are people stealing Vic chips, right? They also used to steal my test leads. So I'm like, buy me 30 test leads, put them in a pile, said, take one. You know, so leave a penny, take one. It's like, leave a lead, take a lead. So meanwhile, one of our chips is failing really bad. Anybody know, what was the worst failing chip? You can't call the Vic chip a failure. I had issues, but what's the worst failing chip? Anybody know? Maybe the BDC and the 128. 64. We'll get to my failures later. <laughs> no, on the Commodore 64, it was our highest failing chip. It's a PLA, right? And we had stolen the PLA, so we kind of got what we deserved. Um, somebody was talking earlier about how one way to innovate is to steal you know, the code from other people. Well, remember, we're a chip design house. So we're stealing other people's chip designs, not just their code. You walked in the R&D lab, and there was this big piece of, uh, of, of cardboard paper with Polaroid pictures on it of the A2S100 made by the Signetics. And we made our own version of it then. And uh, it had a problem with what's called passivation. There's purple creeping crud would get in, in under it. And it only turns out, like five years ago, I learned it was like too much boron in it. We thought it was something we did wrong. It was just something they did. But here we are, I mean, these chips will are only last in five months. Why do I say that? Well, it goes into this mentality of cheap and expendable, you know. <laughs> We, you know, we were a consumer brand division type thing, not, and, and we, we, we did things hard and fast, right? So here when we're doing the TED, remember Jack Tramiel's still around. 
We took the time to do a development system, get it in the developer's hands, and, uh, and again, that's the wrong slide stack, normally I wouldn't even be talking about this. Uh, but hey, you go with what we have. So this was weird though, this actually fits a C64. What was weird was somebody asked me about this, and I had completely forgotten about it, like the scotch tape holding a lid on a chip, right? I mean, what a great place to work. But what freaked me out was that's my handwriting. So I'm looking at the handwriting of a 24-year-old me, right, on a, on a board I don't even remember doing. Too many trips to the park. As, you know, lots of things. <laughs> so, you've seen the case design. The case design was by a guy named Ira Valensky for the, um, that, that cool finned case. And uh, he also designed the joystick. And Ira, Ira worked in the Tokyo office. And he brings in this joystick. And you, do we have any of them here? Any, any of the C16 joysticks or anything? Well, if you look at them, there's a real small neck in there originally. They Then later they flanged it. I said, that'll break. The way kids play with joysticks. Who, who was talking earlier the, about the uh, lawsuits from joysticks or something? Yeah, and, and there you are. And, and I was like, that, that'll break. No, well, I designed it. I was a good designer, but I still thought it would break. So I'm like, okay, turn your attention to that side of the table now. And you hear, snap! <laughs> and then we go, <laughs> slide it on the table. Now I would tell you, it costs like 20000 to make one of these. It's what's called a soft tool. And it did, it was harder for me to break it than I thought it would be, right? But I really had, I'd snapped it off to prove a point. And that was kind of the attitude around there. I mean, we're about to go into mass, mass production, so let's get it right before we go there. So that's, that's the day I broke a $20,000 joystick on purpose. All right, first time I got threatened with my, my job. The, um, as I said, I didn't design the TED. I was the engineer on it. And I make the distinction between, because schematics really were done when I got there. One of the things that I kind of knew at the time was especially on that little 116, that's what the chip developers had in their mind. On that little 116 with the chiclet keyboards, that's actually the data bus for the processor going out there, which is really, really, really a no-no. I mean, honestly, a horrible thing to a data bus. It's horrible for FCC. I mean, you know, all those frequencies would be going out. It's horrible in a lot of ways, but they're thinking, well, we're only using it to read. Well, the rest of the time, it's still a data bus, right? And I hadn't really come to grips with it. I'm, I'm walking around with the schematics under my arm, right? So, and, and so I own the problem. Well, it turns out that like the fire button on the joystick is D0. So now when you have a joystick cable, that's the data line from the processor. And I, what had happened was I'd held it too close to a monitor and the monitor started to flicker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm starting to laugh. I go, if that's really that, then I should be able to crash the processor and I put the coils and it did it crash the processor and it didn't just flicker, it died. And I'm laughing. My boss is not amused. And I'm laughing because I walked around with this thing under my arm all this time and really hadn't said I own it 100% as if I'm going to make changes just because they need to be. And so I'm laughing, I'm going, it's the data lines. He goes, why did you laugh? I said, I was an idiot walking around, I just told you what. He goes, you know, fix it or you're fired type thing, right? Okay, I'll fix it. I, I, first off, I should, not because you told me it needs to be fixed. So an hour later, he comes walking in the lab, and I'm playing like Wizard of War, I think it was, on a tip. He goes, what are you doing? I mean, a lot of people play video games there. You walk around the place, sound like a pachinko parlor. <laughs> and at least half of them were doing what they're supposed to be doing. So I just point. He doesn't get it. I'm playing Wizard of War, not working on the joystick. And I point again, and he's getting really pissed at me. And finally, I had to show him that I wrapped. I had a 25-foot cord put on the joystick, and I wrapped it around the yoke of the picture tube <laughs> to prove that it was now fixed. Now, most kids, I was an XTV repairman, so I wasn't afraid to stick my hands back there, so they were all like, oh, it's been in the monitor. 
And he's, he's pissed at me. And, and basically what I've done, the, the, the commoner way you fix something, I had added a chip, right? So now I've added an Erland. But the, um, I don't want to pay TI for a chip or anybody else. No, I looked at our catalog and I found a chip that looked like it would work. So I called, send downstairs for a tube, right? Because <laughs> I have this magical power. Works on everything except Z80s. We had no, none of those. <laughs> And I put in this 8529 thing, and it turned out to work just right because, you know, kids, not kids, people, managers, they can push multiple buttons at once, right? So if it was TTL-ish type things, you can't short those outputs together. And you can't have TTL going through the keyboard because that would just be noisy for FCC. So it was a perfect fudgy little thing to do. But that was the first time I got threatened with my job was, you know, fix it or you're fired over the joystick port. And some other, other stuff that happened. Uh, it, you may know there's a ROM monitor built into, we used it on the 128 on, on the TED series. Um, we knew we were going to keep it when we got a Telex. Remember Telexes? They were before faxes. You paid per character. I got a Telex saying, you've now invented the perfect pirating tool because you could disassemble anything right from the TED. I sent back a Telex that said, thanks. <laughs> that was, that's a true story. It was the head of Commodore UK sent that. Um, well, other stories. When we moved to Westchester, we're tearing down the lab. There's a golden C64 there. Anybody know what the golden C64 is? What is it? Overpriced. <laughs> they were all overpriced. It's all, we used to say it's just dirty sand, you know, when, meaning the, the chips. It, million 64. Million 64. It was one of several million 64s. The way they, they came up with it, it's the guy's like, it's here somewhere. I can feel it. There, that's the millionth C64. <laughs> they sprayed it gold, took it to the show. So we found one of them while we're doing this. And so that's just one of those uh, stories. Ah, okay. So I told somebody to ask me about the tech. So meanwhile, Jack, Jack leaves, as I've said. His son, Sam Tremiel, starts, still works in Tokyo. He's still head of the Tokyo division. That to me sounds like a bad idea, but that's just me. You, the original TED was designed to use a Commodore 64 power supply. It was around. We had millions of them already on the boat from China. And uh, so suddenly it turns square. I make it round again, it becomes square again. I go overseas, I put it on the thing to make it round again. Meanwhile, the case now is square. I think that's how they finally won. It was, they got to the case drawing last. If I put a round connector back on the PC board, the case would. So good, we've decided on a new square one. Right before we go to production, the metal shield turns to plastic. Well, you can't pass FCC with a plastic ground shield. So this is all Sam Tremiel doing this while he's still, that's my story, right? And the, the way we got, we, we learned for sure what was going on as I'm in Tokyo. I'm looking at the schematic. And the flame retarded plastic specification has been erased. It is now a flameful plastic specification. <laughs> and the engineer's like, it's all money. <laughs> I'm laughing. Because there's no change. And it's, it's clearly somebody had just erased it and put it in, just, just messing with us. So that's kind of what we went through to do the TED. Oh, well, somebody had asked why TED doesn't have sprites. Do I have enough? Yeah. Anybody care why Ted doesn't have sprites? Yeah. Yeah. All right, here's the Ted chip. Real chip. In here's a whole bunch of the color stuff for the 121 colors, right? Is this the Ted? No, I'm sorry, this is the BIC. So these two areas here, and maybe that are the sprite area. Because there's the part that goes and gets the sprite DMA. There's the part that stores the sprite colors. There's the sprite collision logic, which actually worked the first time. Now, you remember I was talking about all the hand layout? They were in awe of the guy that got the sprite collision logic working on the very first try. Look how much of a VIC chip this takes up, right? Well, if I look at a TED chip, and we can tell it's a TED chip because up here it says TED. We start assigning the chips. There's all kinds of little stuff on here. This is, look at the array here. That's for the 121 color stuff. So reason number one why 
Ted doesn't have sprites, and hopefully this is recorded because the uh, uh, because I don't want to write all this in Facebook. I rather just point them at a video. The reason it doesn't have sprites is it doesn't fit. First off, right? There's, there's physically not enough room on a chip dock. The second reason then is, well, wait a minute, where are you going to get all that color information from? If, if you know the Commodore 64, there's actually a 12-bit bus in it, right? There's that little color nibble. Well, we'd have to have 16 bits. We'd have to have all the extra RAM. So reason number two is there's no RAM for it out there. There's no architecture that we need another eight chips and all that. But reason number one was Jack Tramiel didn't want it, right? He ran the place. It was his decision to do it. So, but the real thing is, you know, when somebody says, why doesn't, the victim, why doesn't it have sprites? Well, you're talking about, why doesn't a two-story house have a third story? So, and, and again, then, it's Jack Tramiel's company. So, here, I showed you this family. And then a strange and horrible thing happened. Marketing started inventing crap. Anybody ever hear of a 232? Some people got them out there. Um, nobody here has a 232? The, Actually, uh, there is one person here at the, the show that has oh, one. Is, is it? Jim Brain. Jim. Jim Scott. Mike has one. Right. And uh, somebody said Zimmer has one. Uh, and I know Rob Clark's got one. So this thing appears, right? And, and you know, so what's going on in marketing's mind is, hey, Commodore 64, that sold a lot, right? Well, I'm like, well, that doesn't look like a Commodore 64. What are you doing? So then they come out with this, the plus four. Now this is up, who, who had the, the price tag for it? It was up to two, 349 or something. So the thing that was supposed to design for $79 is now $349, has this software in it. I call it the worst written software. Well, I don't know, I've never used it. I just know it's not worth $300, right? So this is marketing doing this by this time. And then this happens. Finally, it looks like a C64, everybody's happy. We're not. I, as a matter of fact, I got a telex from the head of Japan uh, going, sorry, b -son. That's what he called me. Uh, he, he was telling me this was coming down the pipe. But what happened was, so now Ted has turned into like eight or nine different things. And what happened was, suddenly I'm the most prolific designer at Commodore, the long-haired 24-year-old guy, right? And, and it's because all this stuff happened on my watch. Now, the reason why I mention that is it gave me the ability to do some other things. So, anybody ever see one of these? I know somebody in the room has. Mike has. He was just at my house. This is the Commodore LCD. Right? This is mine. There's three of them. And we, while well, Jack Tremell was still there, we got out and bought a LCD manufacturing company called Eagle Pitcher. We had the only LCD glass in Amer made in America. Let me repeat that. We had the only LCD glass made. Every other piece of LCD actually came from one plant in Japan, even under all the different names. It's, it's like being a chip designer. Now you're chip, we chip fab. We're now we're an LCD fab. And so we were going to do an LCD machine. So after TED, after what was supposed to be the business machine, was now the next portable, right? We, in other words, we're not reinventing the Commodore 64 over and over again. This died a horrible death. I'll talk more about it later. But what it was, I did the design on this, the initial design and architecture. And then something happened in the lab one day. I had hired a guy named Jeff Porter who did the 1200 baud modem. And we hired him because you see right there, it's got this modem, phone and line on it. This had a built-in modem. Ooh, name another computer from the time that did it. There may be, I just don't know of any. But the, um, uh, so he took over the LCD machine, and uh, I looked at Fred Bowen one day in the lab, he looked at me, we looked at the guy that wasn't doing his job very well, and uh, we started thinking about a new computer. <laughs> Talked to my boss, he said, that's fine. You remember, I, 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 I just got a whole bunch of things done, so, I, and he got bonuses for almost all of them, right, so he likes me. This thing was called the D128. Have you all ever heard of the B machines, the P machines? They had a whole bunch of them kind of in storage, and I still don't know what they were when I worked there, right? They were just all these variations, and some were well-known and well-liked. I just didn't know which ones were which. But this guy was working on um, this thing called a D128, and the thing that happened in the lab was 
Freddie is behind me with his engineer, and I'm working on the LCD, and I keep hearing this muttering about, I don't understand what's going on, I don't understand, I listen to this for an hour. Finally, I turn around and I look at the logic analyzer, I said, you've got like a short between your outputs, and the analyzer gets confused and thinks it's three cycles, give me your PLA terms. You photocopied it crooked, you cut off a column, you're missing the terms here, go away. And that's a true story. And Fred Bone goes like this at me. And I, I'm like, mm -hmm. let's hook up, right? So that was the day that we started this. And I was supposed to be co-designer next to the guy so as not to hurt his feelings. And so and for a couple weeks, his name was next to mine. And, and we found something else to do with him. But it was 6509 based. Well, wait a minute. That's 6809. I'm sorry, I should say 6809. Why are we buying a Motorola processor? Right? Remember my whole speech, we make chips? It did this funky banking thing where you would leave some stuff laying around and switch modes. Uh, and it had no code base. So we said, let's put a 6502 in it. Let's use an MMU. Actually, I stole it from the LCD I had done. Let's add an 80 column. See, we're making this up. Let's make it C64 compatible. We, we just said, what the hell? I mean, it wasn't supposed to be any big thing. We, and we didn't mean 100% compatible. We said, let's take a swing at it, right? Well, let's add a SID. I mean, the best known sound check. Why wouldn't you put one in if you own the factory downstairs that makes it, right? Uh, turns out we can double the clock speed. Remember Moore's Law? Just did it, right? <laughs> just double the clock speed one year. We wanted a built-in floppy version, C128, and I wanted a reset switch because I've got the silly perversion about reset circuits that everybody knows about. So in the end, we ended up calling it a C128. Now, nobody told us to do it. What they didn't do was tell us to stop. Matter of fact, we didn't even tell them we had changed the name for a couple weeks, right? And what we learned is if we stayed out in front of management, they couldn't catch up to us to start ruining it. Um, and they did. If they could, I mean, it's like Dilbert Comics. If they could go, oh, I'd like the reset switch to be in the worst place to reach it, they would, right? So if you just show them, we've already finalized the reset switch location, uh, your bonus is pretty much guaranteed. They, oh, they love it. So <clears throat> we got five months. I'm going to take you on the journey with me, right? It's August. You're drunk half the day. You got testosterone, and you got a chip fat. We got an MMU. Let's we let's let's go to 128k. I mean, let's make a true 128k machine, but let's make it like we do MMUs today, where it's it's there. It's not like you're poking and peeking and reaching in a box blindly. It's not that expanded, stupid memory of the early PCs instead or extended, whichever. Um, we needed a pick programmable logic array. We needed a huge one this time. We needed the big chip had to do all kinds of changing. That's how we're going to get our double speed out of it. Processor was a new one. Actually, we put a caps lock key on it or something. New font ROM, and there was this 80 column chip called the 8563. Worst mistake I made while I worked there. I remember the day it happened. The 8563 had been designed for the Z8000. Anybody hear of our Z8000? It went on for years. It's supposed to be a 16-bit business machine. Um, the, the Z8000 folk were strange folk. Uh, one, we never saw them actually get anything done. They went to shows. But the, the, the thing we thought was coolest about them was one day, this just a bunch of programmers, went down and stole all the furniture out of the lobby of Commodore. And they built their own little area, the little conference area. They called it the Z-Lab. We thought that was really cool. We were <laughs> stole the furniture. We're going to stop beating you for a week just for that. That's 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 pretty cool. But that's literally about the only thing we remember good about it. And there were some smart people in there, and they're my friends and stuff. Don't get me wrong. But the Z8000 went nowhere. Well, here's a chip that was going nowhere in the Z8000 going nowhere called the 8563. And I had the the head of IC design came to me and said. Can I sell you on an 80 column chip to use in, in, your, in your C128? We had told him by now, you know, him what it was called. And, I, and he had the designer right behind him. I said, well, does, is it 6845 based? And to anybody 
I thought anybody that was at the level we were at knew what that meant. It meant that it has this kind of timings, it meant that it had this kind of features, and when he said, um, yeah, I know now he was lying. Right? I learned it the hard way. I should have gone through that thing with a fine tooth comb, and I should have done it early, and I should have not believed anything, including their own specs. So that was my mistake for, for not doing it. And so this chip almost derailed us. Now we're down to four months before CES. We skipped right over wire wrapping and stuff. We had never done that before. We went straight to a PC board. If, 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 this, one came, if this was a place I could drive, I'd have brought it, but I'm not bringing it through customs. Um, Mike's, Mike's all on it, it's just full of crap. Um, we had to make emulators for the chips. The chips don't exist yet. They, they, if we get the chips one month before we're done, how are the programmers going to work? So we got to make towers to plug in where chips go. You know, we got to do that the first month, right? Um, I had to make a special version of the processor just to make an analyzer work. And we needed to start FCC in, in that five month period. We're going to start FCC in the third month. And we had to make the, uh, the, the DRAMs work. So here's another mistake I made. Actually, I'm only partially to blame. No, I idolized the 6502. We needed another pin brought out. So we'd gone over to the photocopier of this thing that's called a bonding diagram. A guy pulls it out. We make a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. You know what those look like in the old days. And when we wired it out, we did it too fast. And the only way they could get the wires to fit was they had to turn the die 45 degrees. That is not a normal way to mount a die. So there is a thing called a 6510, and it looks like a tie tack when you see it. So it's like, oh. if, but now I had a rule with my guys, and that was, if you're not making mistakes, you're not going fast enough. We've only got five months to get this done. In fact, if you if 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 you haven't made a mistake, I'm going to ask you why you're slacking, right? It's not about whether you make mistakes or not. Of course, it's how what you do about it, right? So, but this was when I was always, oh, I got my own 6502, and it's screwed up. Oh, the 80 cartridge. How many people, how many people like this? Do you ever know about the CPM cartridge C64s? Do you ever use one, C1? They, um, they didn't work. Some did. But uh, everybody thought they knew what was wrong, because you could change two of the chips on here, change the brand, and it would work. Oh, they're obviously too slow. Turns out one did. But I had a problem with the C the C128 just made it worse, right? Made it literally so I stopped working. But it was a half an amp, and I didn't have half. I didn't want to pay for half an amp for a cartridge that might get plugged in. I'm not going to increase the cost a couple dollars. Plus there was this high failure, um, and you know failed on the so literally overnight and without telling management. Remember, you tell them after it's done, right? We put a Z80 on the board. What else we do? We had to flip the flare. Yeah. So we put a Z80 on the board, and I don't tell management about it until the boards come back. So now it's like, it's a dual processor system. And, the, you know, and we almost like, thanks for the idea. You gave us the idea for a dual processor. So off the manager goes. And so we ended up like overnight deciding to put a Z80 in and making sure we did it in a way where management told us, couldn't stop us. Again, that was the rule. Make it so they can't stop you. Now, we did get a telex, or was it a fax by that time, from Commodore Australia. Now, Commodore Australia was known for the, has anybody ever seen anything from Commodore Australia? He was big in robotics, and he had, he brought us a, a robot that could do things like vacuum your car. He had one prototype. Um, we never saw or heard from him again. But, the, but they, we got a telex that said, if you send us the C128s out with Z80s in them, we will uh, unsolder each and every one. Well, again, I sent back the thing saying thanks. You know, that's, that's like a compliment. So, and, and the, the day that I went to do the first one to make it work, because I really did wedge it in before I did the PC board, we had no Z80s. I couldn't call down for a tube of Z80s. So I had to go get my Sinclair, which I used as a doorstop, and literally pry it open and get the Z80 out of it to work. But, but again, manager man saw me with, the, uh, with my doorstop, and they all had to go get one. 
So, oh, TI-99, so the reason I even had a door, door stop. Um, do you all remember, uh, well, I don't know how old some of you are, but the, um, Jack was a master at, uh, I don't want to say showmanships, marketing ship, whatever. He did the send us your computer and we'll take $100 off. Right? I haven't told this crowd that, right? Okay, just make sure to total up. And, and that's great, because we have people sending us Sinclairs, uh, brand new, for $50 cost them, and they were getting $100 off. So we get, we're getting all these things sent to us, including TI-99s and Atari 800s and all those. And a guy named Yash Terakura sends for downstairs and has a skid brought up of all these different things being sent back. So that's where I got my first doorstop, my Sinclair. I got my Kim 1 from that pile. Um, they had these guns for this, like, shoot for a game. Why well, I had like a gun I would bring to the meetings and set on the table if I was really pissed. There, all this cool stuff came from there. But what came from there were TI-99s. Do, do you know what, what, what happened in production with TI-99? Remember when they went off the market for six months? Mm -hmm. they, the, they would get too hot, the insulation would melt out of the uh, transformer, and the, the chassis would become energized. Nice. And they got a cease and desist. It's not like fix it as you go, it's you stop making them now. And that was a six month period. During that six months, Jack's going, send us your computers and we'll give you a hundred bucks off. So what we did was we got the hardware off the street and I got the programmers off the street. And when TI-99 came to say, we're ready to go again, they, they were, we, we ransacked their house. So, um, and, and so consequently, because of that, I had a, a, a Sinclair hold my door open, and so the day I decided to add a Z80, I, I had a door stop. So it's, it's funny how it all comes around. Here's what the chip emulators look like. Right? I'm just, just kind of showing each one of these, but what they look like when they're on the board, here's the actual prototype of the Commodore 128 when there was only three of them. And you can tell it says prototype only on there. Matter of fact, I've only got 64K of DRAM in it. I hadn't even gotten 128 working yet. And this is what the bottom looked like. Now, this is like three months out from CES. And this is cool. The techs are very, real good techs at this kind of stuff. These are even numbered and stuff. You know, they've got little labels on there. And I've got these big thing power cables and decoupling to make sure that the DRAMs, that the fact they don't work isn't due to noise because they only broke like a dozen times. There's a close-up. But this is what the board looked like when it was working. You can't even see the board. Right? That seemed pretty scary to me if we're like three months from a CES show and this is what it looks like. But I don't know what's scarier is this or the fact that's not what's showing up on my screen below here. Hang on. That your designer looks like that. <laughs> I'm the guy on the right. So that's my board, and that's me, and my beer. That's Dave DiOrio, the guy who was working on the big chip at the time. So, turns out Z80, so as a matter of fact, Dave, I'd said, uh, so now, chips giveth and chips taketh away, right? So one of the things I'd asked to Dave, so I need a Z80 clock. They're actually, TTL can't do it. I need you to have this clock come out, and it needs to slam the five, volt, five volts real quick. He said, I think I can do that. I was going to use a voltage shovel. Well, he was wrong. It, it looked like this, it was curvy and stuff. So here comes my true, true test. I've got three on, still CES, and I take 12 volts. And the problem is, if you're using five volts, it's always going to do this. You, you electronics guys know this, right? But if I go to 12 volts, it happens way up here. So what I did is I, added, I stuck 12 volts in the circuit, and it was like, wham, to 12 volts. And then I had the transistor kind of just go, oh, trying to use right language. And that transistor clamps it to five volts. So it's like, and that's where I got the nickname Cap Kluge. But this was the kind of things we were having to do. Here was another one. Uh, you know, you can press a lot of keys. You need a, 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 the cap lock key. Your Commodore had never done a cap lock key. So we added it to the 8502 on a port. The problem is we had added a Z80. So it turns out the Z80 can't read the cap lock key. So I had to ask the 8502. So now, we're getting, ready for, we're getting ready for CES. We're two months out. 
We get a new version of the 8563 and each one's getting worse and worse. We call this the Eddie prompt. Hey, look at the chip designer. What's up, man? Not only did you lie to me about it not being a 6845, your crap's getting worse and worse. Well, right in the middle of this, he decided that he wanted to reduce power consumption. And he would do that by something called a back bias, which is where you make the substrate, the, the, the ground, so to speak, let two volts negative. And it's like clearly he had other uh, uh, motivations than I did, right? Because I'm trying to get to see yes. Once I learned it was uh, substrate, it turns out that there's a 49th pin on here. It's this gold tag. Turns out, you put a meter on it, it had like negative one, negative 1.9, 1 .9, but it was awesome. It was moving like this. You know, from each frame. And I grounded it with a ground wire. Turns out that works. Pissed him off. <laughs> he came in, it's like I soldered a wire to his kid or something. <laughs> but that, that was just like, who would think to solder to that thing? I'm like, I got three months to see yes. I'm going to think of everything possible. Rubber is in CPM cartridges didn't work. Is they would do, they would do uh, address, address, hold, address, address, hold. But there's a cycle on the Z80 where it try to hold it at 1.2 volts for an entire DRAM cycle. Well, that just, that's really bad. <laughs> the, what would happen is one brand would go into oscillation when it saw 1.2 volts. So it had nothing to do with speed. And I actually had to sanitize that story to the point where, <laughs> where it didn't make sense. But, the, uh, but that, that was interesting. So we finally figured out how to do it. And, and meanwhile, this is what it took to make the Z80 live on there. Now, you might say, why add all this jungle stuff? Well, I've already submitted to FCC. So I'm allowed to make jumpers, but I'm not allowed to add chips anymore. Now, I never was going to put any expensive stuff on here. So if you ever see a C128, um, the other thing I did was I got a uh, list of what was in stock in, in Hong Kong. I literally designed from stock. So we had a million and a half of these at the day I designed it in. So that's why it's, if people go, that's a real jungleistic looking thing. Yeah, I know. I designed it from stock, but each one of those cost me a penny, and that's the penny it takes to put it in the board. Ah, so now we're getting close. Meanwhile, the head of QA, we've gotten a QA department. Sounds like a good idea, because we hadn't had one. Turns out he was, Oh, he was his own. He, he, his idea uh, for the 128 was he stood on a chair one day and all, it shall not work. And from then on, whenever there was a problem, he goes, see, I told you. Well, okay, I don't mind you trying to find things wrong. In fact, it'd be really nice if you did. But just trying to get me fired or trying to make it fail as a project won't work. Well, I had, they were doing cartridge testing in the basement. And I had traded a guy some of those IE 488 cables for a phone call. I said, you call me before they come up, if they ever come up. Well, one day I get the call, right? And he's like, they're on their way up. And it's like pit pitchforks and torches. And here's the head of QA with the cartridge going, ha ha, I have proof it does not work. And the movie Dirty Harry was real popular about that time. So I actually, if you remember the scene where he's eating the sandwich, I've got a sandwich, you know, because I got to call my office. So I'm eating the sandwich as he's approaching. And what I do is I take the cartridge from his hand. I mean, he wasn't going any further with it. I mean, it's my cartridge, my, my problem. And so now he's scurrying after me going, but I'm the one that proved it. I, sh I shove it into the Commodore 60, or into the 128, and it's Koala Paint. Which it, I like Koala Paint. Had it for the 64. The problem was that font is the Commodore 64 font, but it's been made bigger. Well, one of the things we had thought was, you know, we matter of fact, that's the Atari font. We stole it out of the font ROM. By the way, we made ROMs for Atari. We really screwed them one year too. We we had um, we actually had posters that had uh, a picture of Santa Claus with a bag of ROMs going, you'll get it by Christmas. And one year we were like, they're coming. They're coming. They're not coming. <laughs> and that was just it. Don't do business, Jack, with your competitor. What are you doing? It's Jack Trammell. You know, business is war, right? So anyways, the Atari font, which became the C64 font, which became my font, does this. It would paint the K-Red. 
It would paint the O red. It would paint, and then it would miss the dot on the eye because we had moved it. And it would do this. Well, back in 1985, that took about a minute, you know, the painting to paint it in. So that's all that was wrong with it. You know, the, oh, we've got Bill by the, you know, throngs now, was we moved the dot on the eye. Literally, an hour later, we've stuck another ROM on there. It's called Brick Lane. Ran a wire to it, had it working again. So, we, I mean, we fixed every problem overnight, and a lot of problems that you can fix in an hour. But there wasn't a single major problem that we started a day with that wasn't fixed by the next day, because if, if we couldn't fix it in a day, we weren't going to get done in time. So my, my record was 11 days without leaving. I had an air mattress in my uh, office, and other people would use it. If I walked in my office and I see a pair of legs under there, you know, I'd be quiet and stuff. It's like hot, hot bunking, right? My girlfriend was a technician there, and there was nights where um, I'd go wake her up about two in the morning. I'd show her what needs done, and I'd sleep till about four. She'd come wake me up and say it's done, and by morning I'd be able to show the managers, um, you know, that something that was fixed. So the next failure. Oh, this one almost got us. The guys from Texas show up, the speak and spell guys. Well, they've got magic voice. They plug it in. They're pretty proud of it. You know how on regular C64 cartridges, we have a couple little solder terminals here for Jumper and X-Game, those things, people familiar with it? Well, they did something nobody had ever done before, which was toggle them on the fly. Right? No, nobody had done it. We didn't, nobody said you could. What happens then when you shove one of these in a C128, the 6502 would go, I'm going for the reset vector. And this cartridge would go, I'm going to intercept that, I'm going to shove my own crap down your throat. Well, the problem is it's made for a C64. It doesn't know how to start up a 128. And this was a major problem. So again, I, I'm going to fix it overnight if I can, because I, I can't. If I get another problem tomorrow this big, I'm screwed. I called Von Ertwein, the guy who did our, our, uh, our CPM code, because I had a crazy idea. And he wasn't home, but his wife was. And she looked up the codes for me. We stuck an inverter in the reset pass. So now they, when we go to do a reset, it's going high, toggling low, instead of low, toggling high. Well, it turns out the Z80 wants an opposite polarity reset. And the Z80 boots from down here, not from up here. So overnight, what we did was we made the Z80 start first. And he'd look out there and go, oh, that cartridge is out there, man. <laughs> Here, I'll set it in 64 mode for you. And also, when you hold down the Commodore key, that's the Z80 going, just, I'll take your word for it, 64 mode, here you go. So again, in one day we fixed it by, but now we totally changed the whole dynamic of how the 128 boots, and we're going, yeah, what's for breakfast? <laughs> here, there's our just explain it. Yep, yep. Okay, so another problem to have, I'm just throwing random stories at you. By the way, if you got any questions, ask Scott. Um, when did the VIC chip stop working? We're now one and a half months from VIC, from CES. Dave Yuri spends his day looking at this. We go out to the bar to do this. We are Michelob drinkers. Recognize that bottle? They don't even make these anymore, right? And then he goes, I know what's wrong. What had happened was he had looked through the microscope and he had seen they had used one of the masks. They used one of the old ones wrong. So he had looked through the microscope and under the influence of beer realized that the dots didn't line up right. They, to you and me, we wouldn't recognize anything that looks like that green stuff at the top. <clears throat> Here's another fix we did. Right now we're almost to the production board. I'm going to make millions of this. I've got 20 of them now or something, because now I'm past the three. And it's, it's crapping every now and then. This, these are the boards we're going to see, yes, this is... And the problem was, it was like a DRAM corruption. Well, when, when DRAMs get corrupted, you trip over it here, but the problem happened way back here. How do I know when my memory got corrupted? And by memory, I mean everything's jumping on and off the bus. You can't just say it's memory, therefore it's the memory problem. Well, the one thing I noticed was I'd get an at sign in the one spot on the screen, and I circled that spot. And I took a Commodore light pen. I still have it. That's my 30-year-old Commodore light pen. I held it up to that at sign, I ran it in a logic analyzer, 
And so now I'm using the, the, the video refresh kind of like a memory looker, like a memory monitor. And the second that, the microsecond that at sign appeared, actually it'd be within, you know, the one frame scan, it'd catch it in about three attempts. We caught it on the analyzers, what was causing the memory corruption. And what it was, was this little ground path here was about a sixteenth of an inch too long. And the ground was lifting on this chip. When you wrote a 1110, it changed to a 11111. So now we're a month out of CES. This kind of thing we're fixing. So that little that little jumper made it work, or not at all. Who's heard the hole in the wall story? Anybody want to hear the hole in the wall story? You want to just move on? So now that now the security guard, see QA's messing with me, managers are messing with me, the laws of physics are messing with me. That phone call is messing with me. <laughs> the security guards decided to get involved. You know, we had moved here from, from Westchester, and uh, so it was all new kind of build out upstairs. And they got the idea that every door with a door lock should be locked. We didn't have a key. I don't know anybody had the key, but we didn't have the key. So first time, um, I had to climb over the ceiling, mm -hmm. and you get that white crap all over you, yeah. and I opened it. I put up a sign that says, please don't lock this. There's no key. The next day, security guards, because we, we actually kind of respected their single-minded whatever it is that makes you not read the sign, they lock it again. I crawl over again. Get tired. And this time I'm more church. Don't lock the door, there is no key. They do it again. They said that I punched through the wall in one punch. It was two. <laughs> it was one for this layer and then one to get all the way through. And it's a good thing because I almost hit the light switch with my knuckles that was on the other side of the wall had I gone through in one. So now I got this reputation. Bill punched through the wall in one punch. Then the next day, the door's locked. <laughs> I had to put a sign that says, don't lock the door, there's a fire trucking hole in the wall next to the door. <laughs> now, I didn't use the word fire truck. <laughs> they still locked the door. I, mean, we had, I think we took the doorknob off, finally. So that's one hole in the wall. Um, I'll tell you about the other hole in the wall later. So, the guys put an Easter egg in. Yeah, they didn't tell me about it because they knew if I knew this was in there, the first time they said we're out of ROM, I just said then take the Easter egg out, right? Because I'm not going to fail due to this. Thing. When they made this, they found that the V had a bar over it, and our QA department never found it because you know they're too busy trying to get me fired. So the font wrong. Remember we had to make a whole new layer and stuff like that. Then we, then we made it one chip. So. We, we need a new font, we need a new ROM. I had this perk chart said when everything needs to be done to be done in time for CS. I said, I need to release it Tuesday. So I'm in, I'm in the meeting, giving them my, my status. And the head of software, whose name was Julian, and I'm going to do an impression of Julian because I can't talk about him without doing it because we were had to put up with this. He said, well, this is really a software issue, so we should be in charge of releasing the ROM. That's fine, I need a Tuesday. That's an easy thing, right? I think it's Tuesday, you know, about the week before. Well, I wait, I wait. Meanwhile, a memo had come out. That they'd given the middle manager's offices, and people had been breaking into it. So they put out a memo that said, anybody caught breaking into offices will be fired. And it all but said, you too, Bill Hurd, because I had this reputation of climbing over the walls. Well, I break into the guy's office. I steal it out of his, this is the day it has to go to MOS, right? I steal it out of his desk drawer, it's still right there in the, he's not touched it. I send it to MOS, I make my schedule, I make my CS show the next Tuesday. He, uh, I said, how's that coming? It's your two days past the thing. Oh, it's still under review, and I'm like, liar! I broke into your office, stole the wrong, released it to MOS. <laughs> And all that because this Easter egg found the V over Vaughn, right? We 
weird stuff was happening. Ah, talk about that one offline. Oh, so we're almost to see yes. And then suddenly the PLA stops working. The guy had done something and it screwed it up. There's a whole story I'll tell you later. Then finally, the thing that, that kept us from CS, we get the last version of the 8563. And see, the 8563 has its own clock. I got mine. That's called asynchronicity. It means that if I'm here, this is what he looks like, right? There's no time to know something happens for sure. Well, there's ways to fix that. Well, I found out the guy that told me he was doing a 6845 version of the chip actually didn't know about this. Well, he sort of did. He said, well, since it can always statistically happen, I didn't try and desynchronize it. Synchronize it. And, you know, by statistically happen, it's like 1 times 10 to the 23rd, which is like five and a half years, which is great for Commodore. I mean, you know, C64s only stayed up for 20 minutes at a time back then. Um, so it was completely broken. We couldn't even load the font in it because it would crash every time we're doing it. I get finally really, really pissed. I take his boss down to where he's working in the lab, and now I've got guys with pitchforks and torches. It's pretty cool, actually. I could get into mob action, right? And we go down there, and he goes to show it, and it pops up while he's showing it. And he goes, it does that sometimes. He reaches for the reset switch. I shot my hand out and grabbed his hand. He's going like that, trying to hit the reset switch. And I just turned to his boss. I said, and he goes, we're done. The, he's like, fix it. I mean, he read this guy the right act. Turns out he wasn't even using the right version. They were testing the wrong version, telling us there was no problem. However, CES is coming, and we don't have an 80 column chip. Two weeks from CES show, I make a tower that sticks under this chip that has a phase lock loop, and basically, I stopped letting it have its own clock. I, I took some from here, I took some from there. This board cost $1,200. We had them made in eight hours, eight or four. But back then, it's like, where do you even find a place that does that in the 80s, right? And then we all stood around the, uh, the radio. <coughs> you know, when the guy was late getting back, we sent, our, we sent our most alcoholic technician who's riding a motorcycle to pick him up. <laughs> So we're hanging around the radio expecting, there's a horrible accident on Route 202, there's PC boards all over the road. You know, I mean, we just don't know what to think. They do arrive, they do work. We stick this in, and this works for, um, uh, this works for CSO, and there's one jumper on there because I, I didn't know how to make it work either, so I left one wire where we can move it till it worked. So finally we get to CSO, and there's one last problem. This looks like the Matrix, right? <laughs> turns out, um, he, the guy had left a bug in for us. Um, it turns out that he's from Texas, the guy who designed the chip. And we run into a guy from Texas before, who he designed the gate array that went with that, that talking version thing I was telling you about with the speaking spell. And he said, well, if you really want it, you write to the register twice in a row. And we're like, you mean do it, do it now? Yeah. How about a pretty please do it? Yes. Well, I guess. Uh, let's call it a Texan write. So that's what we call it when you write twice to it. Well, sure enough, this guy still has this issue in the 80 column chip that when it, you went to scroll, and by the way, it only scrolled 256 characters. That's two and a half rows. It's like, oh, oh, that's not a scroll. Right? So I missed that, right? I should have read that it was some silly little. It should be like lines and lines and lines. You should scroll the whole thing. So when it would scroll, if you didn't write to it twice in a row, it would leave a character behind. It looked like it was crying. It looked sad. <laughs> Vaughn, who wrote CPM, his didn't do that. Well, it's because he stayed on Rev 5. We're up to write Rev 9 now, right, on this chip, because the guy kept going. The guy was brilliant, by the way. The guy that did the chip had patents on the 68,000 when he worked at TI on cells. They didn't know how to design the whole thing, right? That was the issue. So we told Vaughn about the Texan right. And he sits down. He does not have the ability at CES to, by the way, that's what the CES looks like, the show back then. Can you tell it's the 80s? By the way. <laughs> so Vaughn sits down with a, 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 a disk editor. Well, because he couldn't bring all the stuff you needed to compile CPM back then. So he reads from the disk, which is stored backwards. Sectors are backwards, and then the sectors are something else backwards, and then there's checksums. 
and he finds the equivalent code that he can write, writes it backwards to a disk, gets the checksum to agree, and so he rewrites CPM on the fly in this room. This is literally the room we rent. There's the, like the data I.O. for the EPROMs behind her. And so the night of CES show in the CES booth, this is the second floor of the booth, by the way, um, he saves CES. We're like, yeah, well, we fix everything overnight. We told you that, right? So we finally do make the CES. When we got to CES, this was everywhere. It's billboard. They're driving in from, from the airport. Billboard. In the airport, these were all over the floor. And they all said that it was expandable to 512K or something. Well, my boss, remember, let a boss get out in front of you and he'll show his management, right? My MMU only went to 256K. And I just, I needed one more rev to get it to 512. And he said, no. Well, it's like the schedule says, I can. It won't even cost anything. I have these bats ready to go. No, it's too risky. Okay. We see all this too expandable to 512K. I wish I had the real one because it actually says it in, in big things. No, it's the Commodore.ca up there. It's where I got this image. Um, so we had the post meeting. And the CEO, Marshall Smithton, is there. And when we do dog and pup pony shows, all the managers rush to the front. And we just hang in the back of the meeting and shout things. And I heard him, he says, so where's the 512K expansion plug-in? He goes, in the back. Well, there was no 512K expansion, right? Because we didn't use the MMU like we were supposed to. By the time they're done talking, it's like me, him, him, and him had already gone out the door and were designing this thing, the REU. <laughs> right? Because it, it, it was there. He told it, he committed, there's billboard set it. And it's a good idea, right? So uh, that's where the REU came from, where we said, let's DMA it in, right? Let's, let's, let's make it appear like a two-byte interface, and we caught the programmers in time where they could add the get and put instructions. And so when we got to CS for Chicago, which, by the way, we're already did well into production and stuff, Hedley Davis had written this, and it was a showstopper. People, you know, it's animation, but we're doing it with an REU, which we wouldn't have been able to do had my boss not lied in the first place. Uh, I just show this is one of the things I had to do. I found I couldn't do anything to the C64 and be compatible. By the way, we never said it was 100% compatible. A guy claiming to be the product manager had gone and gotten an interview. His name was Tony Dow, Tom Dow, but they thought he was Tony Dow from Leave It to Beaver and quoted it that way. And he said, yes, it's 100% compatible, which there's no such thing. Well, I had to put a glitch back in the IO chip selects. Turns out people were using glitches, and they're allowed. I'm not allowed to say you can't use it, and then I'm not 64 compatible. So that's just one of the examples I showed where I couldn't even move the dot on the eye. So I'm out of slides here because of the, oh, no I'm not. Uh, nerd quick, so how am I on time? Can I keep telling stories or you want me to stop? No, keep going. Okay. Time is flexible. So. Boss goes to Chicago, uh, goes to, this is the final rev where I've hidden 10 little wire changes in, in the PC board and now I have to go to the final FCC version. The changes are permissible as long as I'm only adding transistors or moving wires. So that's rev set, that's where this comes from. This is it, this is all the kahunas. Everything we did, let's get here. With the boss gone, he left the head of the drafting department in charge. He came down on us because we had taken entirely too much resources. And it just had to stop. And so he stopped the PC board production, or the, the design. It was, you know, it was sitting there on a, in a dark room, you know, with the side parts. And it stopped. The boss gets back, says, what the heck's going on? And now we have to work all weekend long, three shifts. The whole weekend. So I go in, I take my air mattress into this cold, dark room. I had bought some Egg McMuffins only, they were from Burger King. And I put them on the shelf next to my little air mattress. Because I have to stay there. If they have a question, I have to answer right away. There are no cell phones, they can't call me. So Monday, Monday Sunday night, it was so cold in that room that Sunday night, those Egg McMuffins were still good. <laughs> right? 
So I'm there under my army jacket and asleep. When I trained them, they, they would just tap me on the foot. And I'd wake up like Frankenstein, and they'd ask me a question on a point. And so after that effort, and you should see these guys. They're like air traffic controllers. And when it's a shift change, a guy comes in, he sits down. This guy's going click, 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 click. And now the guy next to him starts pointing to things to do because they're going to push us and shoves and all this. And he's getting slower, and he's getting faster, and eventually they switch chairs. And then that's a shift change, and that guy's going for another eight hours. So that's where this came from, rest in peace, hurt fish, leg, way, par, Paul, oh, Paul, right, I know who that is. So this, this was in commemoration of a manager idiotcy over a weekend. So post-CES, remember the LCD machine? Wonderful machine. If there was a choice between a C128 and an LCD machine, it should have been the LCD machine that made it. Now I thought a big red circle would come through, it didn't. They canceled it. They canceled it in spite of having orders. They canceled it. New management. Here's all the plans of buying Eagle Pitcher. And frivolously, we don't do that. The C128D, which is the one I liked that should have been done, doesn't get made either. And, and part of that whole thing I was just talking about with the PC board was harder and longer because the PC board fit both simultaneously. This, this is the one where the keyboard snaps underneath and has a handle and everything. They did a metal one later, but it's just, it had video noise and wasn't, it wasn't the same thing. And then that was kind of, at that point, I leave after, after the, the, this ramps down. And, you know, I, before I say I should say, after CS, you see people walk in the halls like zombies and things like that. It's like they don't know what to do with their lives. The, um, Oh, and I thought I was hoping there was one last slide. So underneath all, oh, there it is. You, you can't see. See this wire? One last story. When we got to production, there was one last problem. And me and my boss were arguing. And what it was was CPM wouldn't load 20% of the time. And we start arguing. And he goes, well, then I'll just put somebody else on. I'm like, fine, you do that. Well, then I will. Well, okay, you will. I went home. I took a shower. I slept. I had five days off. It was wonderful. The people around me appreciated my new found hygiene, you know. <laughs> he cocks in on Friday, walks in on Friday. I wish you could see the whole slide. I, it's, that's not what's showing up. Oh, well, no, it is. But, but we were looking at it out there. There's this wire that's on each and every production unit. And what happened then was, he comes into my office on Friday, and he says, fix it or you're fired. Thank you, been waiting for you to say, this poor guy didn't get anywhere during the week. An hour and a half later, I think I know what the problem is. There's a trace, A10, address line 10, has to run to the Z80, has to run to the 6502. And when the Z80 was in charge, and I'm staring in the scope, <laughs> I could see something. And it wasn't there during the 6502. It wasn't there on A9. And it looked like a reflection. And the way I saw it was you stare at the scope real hard and then look at the wall. And you could see, you know, dark on line. And so I was known for this. People just like, heard staring at the wall again. I... <laughs> but it was. I'm going, there it is. Can't you see it? Of course, they can't see it. It's burning in my retina. And I put a wire on the board. And it fixes it. Now, it, the reason it fixes is it's a standing wave. And this, the 6502s on one end and the multiplex to the DRAMs on the other, they're perfect. There's no standing. But the Z80 injects on a stub right here. So I, I say it's kind of like taking a flute. You blow the flute from the end, it's like blowing a flute, but you blow a flute from one of the holes along the edge of it. That's not right. It, it sound, doesn't sound right. Well, it didn't stand right. And by putting a wire as an alternate path, it never reflected, it just kept going, even though they'd go like this. My boss doesn't believe because an hour and a half later, after he had a week guy, you know, a week of a guy looking at it, an hour and a half later, I said, I think this is it. He goes, well, we gotta test it. I said, you need to test it, because that's just, just insane. We go to production with that. So we do a run of 10,000 over the weekend, which to be a production run anywhere else, right? This is a prove her wrong run. <laughs> then Sunday I go walking in, case of beer on my shoulder. The one guy's mad because they put the guy who didn't find this. He's down. In, he's down on the super line, putting you know screws in. 
And he said, but if I put my own here and you were walking around with a case on your shoulder. I said, you didn't find it? Sorry, here, you want a beer? <laughs> So, um, and, and so that, that, that's in um, each and every of the comp, say 128s we had that wire. Anybody know how many 128s we ended up selling? In other words, how many wires are out there? How many? Five to six. Five point seven million is the number I use. <coughs> Possibly more than the Apple II. Uh, not that I care. <laughs> but, but, but we don't have any, um, um, you know, the C128 was just a stock gap. The Amiga is coming, right? Act 3 is coming. The day of the elves is over. The day of men has come. <laughs> we have to have something at CES show. Management couldn't stop us in time, so we made the 128. We, in, I get asked, you know, in the 64 mode. Putting the 64 mode in was actually my way of helping support the developers that had written for the Commodore 64, right? I had somebody come to me at the one CES show where we had done the TED, and she said, I just wrote this educational software and now it's useless. It won't run on your new machine and I'm a small business. So I, that, that, that got through to me. So the 64 mode there wasn't there because marketing said to and stuff. I mean, it was cool to run all that software, but it was also wish supporting you too, right? And it doesn't hurt if this Commodore 64 is the biggest guy on the net block, it doesn't hurt to run its dang code. And people go, well, did you know CPM wouldn't be used? And some people say, oh, I used it all the time. Well, no, we didn't. Our job was to put all of this stuff out there for you and let you figure out what you want. We have an 80, where the first computer does 40 column, 80 column. I've got two different processors, three OSs, 64, 128, and CPM. And, and let you choose, right? I don't know what you're going to use. Not my job to know what you're going to use. My job is to get nine pounds of poop in a ten pound bag. No, I'm sorry. I call it a nine pounds of poop in a five pound bag because I couldn't quite get ten to fit. But the, but the 128 was really a stopgap measure. It's just supposed to help us get through one cycle, one year, and then the Amiga was going to come. So the fact they made it for years, that wasn't supposed to happen. The fact they're still working, that's not supposed to happen. I made it way too cheap for that. Um, remember how I said I designed from production from from stock? Well, that turned out to be a false savings because I ran out of stock then because we made way more than I thought we would. So in the end, the price of the 128 goes up, and because of all the number of chips, the reliability goes down. But you know, I, that wasn't the variable I was solving for. I was solving for a CES in five months and selling for a year. So, is there any questions or anything or any complaints? <laughs> Go ahead, now's the time. You want to know, well, why is the serial bus slow? I'm sorry, why is the serial bus? Everybody know why the serial bus is slow? No. There was a compatibility issue between the uh, 1541 and the You're close. They're, they're, when the VIC came along, it had a DMA cycle, and it needed like the 40 microseconds to do a, a, a whole line. So the difference between the 1540 and the 1541 is it has to put enough time out there for the DMA to, to, to cycle through. Um, but it was supposed to be a hardware shift register, or a hardware serial bus. Anybody hear this? Yeah. So the, the reason why is we make our own chips. Did I mention that? <laughs> we screwed it up. We had a floating node, right? And so we're like, we're listening to the serial bus. When we would flip it to transmit, a charge had accumulated. And it's like the equivalent of thump, right? It goes, that charge gets out on the bus and it lock up the peripherals. So it was a floating node inside in the 6526. So we go and we fix it because we make chips. We put two traces, extra traces on the board, send it to Japan so that we can work it in software or hardware mode. They look at it, think they're a, they're a uh, think that they're a bug, right? They're not, they're a mistake, and they remove them. And now we are stuck with the software shift register thing. The story about Jack Tramiel saying it'll sit here when it's done, right here on Monday morning, and, and Bob Russell fixed it, that's the story. I mean, the fact it works at all is due to that. Now, me personally, I carried a Mach 5 cartridge in my back pocket. I mean, I, you know how you get wallet marks on your thing? I had a Mach 5 mark on my jeans from carrying it around. So that's why it's so. I'm sorry, what were you? I just I, I, I thought the end you in the 128. I also reported four banks with the 22 in it. Yeah. Never quite understand. Joe Kurzuki, the guy that said there's no time to add the pins. The thing that made the REU. That's it. I'm going, I, just, I just need this last little thing, the last rev of the chip. And the only reason we didn't was 
I didn't want to slow down a different chip, so I, I jockeyed it. And so, no, that's that's a Dilbert management issue. So, yeah, it was. It was supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're lucky it only does that. <laughs> yes? The caps lock key shifts up every character but one. The Q? Yeah, that's because of that QA department I was telling you about. <laughs> Literally, one day after it's out there, we release it. And the user groups are going, the shift queue doesn't work. They also found the Easter egg the first <laughs> we he had, he had exclusive or hashed it, dropped it right in the middle of like the logarithm table or something like that, their trade table, and, and they still found it the first day. We should we should have got user groups to do our QA. So yeah, yeah, we had a we had a pet. It, it just meant it was that means they never typed their own department name, right? QA. <laughs> they, I remember one guy said there he, he's running a test there and one of the QA guys worked near me. And, and these numbers are going up. What are you doing? You're are you oh, you're testing memory and then comparing the results and incrementing through real good. That's pretty cool. Just go. I'm just watching it. He just said I I plus one type thing. So, any other questions? Yeah. Actually, I, I did talk about the, okay. the Jeff Porter yeah, did the 1200 and ended up on the on the thing. So thank you for that though, because I, I cannot remember things. Is somebody else did? So, all right, guys, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for the reception you've given me here. This has been one of the coolest groups I've come to. And, uh, you know, thanks for listening to the babbling of, a, of an old guy. And it's really been an honor talking to you today. So thank you very much.